So the second scripture lesson is a gospel lesson, the Old Testament story of Joseph and that tension between having to break the truth to his brothers feeds a bit into the gospel story from Luke chapter 6. These are verses 17 through 31. Listen to God's word. Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch Jesus, for power came out from him and healed all of them. And then Jesus looked up at his disciples, and he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude and revile you and defame you on account of the Son of Man. For rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven." for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. And woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. But I say to you that listen, Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, then offer the other also. And from anyone who takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke all describe a time when Jesus offered an extended sermon to a large crowd of followers. Matthew has Jesus do this sermon on a mountaintop, hence the name the Sermon on the Mount. Mark has Jesus preach by the seashore, but Luke makes an important point out of Jesus preaching on a plain, a level place, where he stood at eye level with all of his listeners. Now, I recognize this is ironic where I'm standing, but in that case, there was no pontification from on high. In that case, there were no balcony seats or luxury boxes for the rich to monopolize. Everyone in attendance came on general admission. It was a tumble of humanity, rich and poor, young and old, the curious and the skeptical, all alike to hear the teachings of this Jesus of Nazareth. Now, the people standing in front of Jesus that day were a mixed bunch, and they likely all wanted something different from him. If they or if someone they loved were ill, then they were hoping for a healing If they were anxious, if they were depressed or grieving, they wanted Jesus to offer them a word of comfort and hope. Because in uncertain times, whether then or now, we want a word from Christ that is just for us and our needs, as well as a word that will hopefully calm the troubled waters of the seas of life around us. And so that's why Jesus' location in this story is so important. Jesus came to them and spoke on the plain, at their level, literally in their midst. He offered direct eye-to-eye words of faith. And that's actually a very important lesson for all of us. If you want to care for others after the example of Christ, then notice carefully the location in which you find yourself. Are you trying to do your work from on high, seeing others as somehow below your station? 
Are you trying to work from a distance, keeping people at arm's length? Or are you right there in their midst, on level ground, eye to eye, heart to heart? What is true for real estate is also true for faithful living. Location, location, location. Now, in the Sermon on the Plain in Luke's Gospel, Jesus looks at this crowd in front of him, and then what he does is he offers four Beatitudes and four woes. Matthew's version of this sermon is much more popular because there you get eight Beatitudes and no woes. But there's actually wisdom in this choice of Luke to pair words of goodness as well as words of challenge. Any honest faith talk can't be all sugar water, nor can it be all vinegar. It can't all be pie in the sky. It can't all be fire and brimstone. Our lives are more diverse than that. As the great country music theologian Mary Chapin Carpenter has said, sometimes you're the windshield, sometimes you're the bug. So Jesus doesn't mince words with the crowd that's standing there before him. As I said, he names four blessings and four woes, but all of them likely touched each person on some level. Are you poor? Blessed are you, for yours is the kingdom of God. Are you rich? Well, woe to you if you treat your riches as if you already have the kingdom of God. Are you hungry? Blessed are you, for you will be filled. In fact, satisfied in a way deeper than mere food can offer. Are you full now? Well, woe to you, because now you have no appetite for the wealth, the beauty, the riches of the kingdom. Now, sometimes we wish Jesus wouldn't try and give us both doses, that he would simply put us into our camps and tell us directly who we are. You on the left, if you're weeping now, be of good cheer, for you will in time laugh. You on the right, if you're laughing now, will woe to you because you'll be crying soon enough. But Jesus is only speaking to one single group of people. This isn't an us-them sermon. It's a both-and sermon. And so he told them not to be filled with despair, and not to be filled with false pride. And that may not have been the message they wanted to hear that day, but it was the plain truth that applied to all of them as they stood on the plain. There's a story about an Amish farmer who was one day confronted by an overly enthusiastic young evangelist. And the evangelist came to the farmer and said, Brother, Have you been saved? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? The farmer looked back at him and said, Why do you ask me such a thing? I could tell you anything. But here, here's the name of my banker. Here's the name of my grocer. Here's the name of my neighbors and my employees. You ask them if I'm saved. We are seldom the best person to answer the question about whether we merit a blessing or a woe, whether we are faithful or unfaithful. There are times when blessings fall on our ears and provide that comfort we so sorely need, just as there are times when words of criticism hit us square in the chest and remind us of the work still to be done. And so that's why Jesus started his Sermon on the Plain the way he did, with blessings and with woes. Now, if I took a poll right now of all of you, and I asked you to say one word to describe how you're feeling, I can imagine some of the words I might hear, some of the polar opposites Catherine hinted at. Tired, stressed, uncertain about tomorrow, maybe hopeful that things will get better, maybe just hanging on. And I get that. That's why I also imagine that Jesus' tone softened before he went on with his message that day. Because what he said next was something comforting and invitational. 
After the blessings and woe, verse 27 begins with the little phrase, but I say to you that listen. You that listen. You who have quieted your inner monologue enough to let the still, small voice of God inside for a moment. And in that space, then Jesus lists off for the crowd around him nine examples of love in action. But these are surprising examples. They're topsy-turvy examples. But again, they too are plain truth examples. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for the abuser. If struck, turn the other cheek. If your coat is requested, offer your shirt as well. Give to all who ask, and don't ask back for what's been taken. Do to others as you would have done to you. Now, those sayings all seem simply the opposite of what was expected. Loving enemies, praying for abusers, turning the other cheek. It's like an inversion of the moral code, a definition of love that now has been turned on its head. I recently read about something called a Dutch auction. Now, you all know regular auctions. At a regular auction, an item is lifted up, and an auctioneer starts at a low price, and then you start bidding against other people, and the price goes up until finally one person has the highest bid and gets the item. But in a Dutch auction, the exact opposite occurs. A high price is named, and then the auctioneer starts lowering the price until finally one person says he or she will pay that amount, and then they get that item. Now, if you jump early into this auction, you run the risk of paying too much. But if you wait too long, you'll lose. What Jesus does is turn the idea of love on its head. Love is not just what we show to those who love us, but we show it to those who are different from us, who are indifferent to us, in fact, even antagonistic to us. And that's why I think Jesus' tone softened when he got to this part of the sermon. You can't shout at someone, hey, love your enemies. It doesn't work that way. That's not the behavior that can be coerced. Goodness knows it's not even behavior that we'll do properly probably 75% of the time. But it's what Jesus said gently, compassionately, and then he ends with the greatest truth of all. Do to others as you would have them do to you. That final commandment, what it's doing is it's asking us to ask ourselves, what is it that I want most of all? What is the deep yearning of my spirit? Who am I behind my mask? Am I filled with things? But somehow feel empty of substance? Am I distracted? Am I entertained? But my life lacks purpose. Or am I literally struggling? Am I literally poor and hungry and alone or unjustly pushed to the margins? How do I wish to be treated? And then Jesus offers the comfort of knowing as he looks over this crowd, he sees them and us just as we are. He knows our hearts. He knows our pain. He knows our distractedness and our unease. And he knows the one-word answer we would give this day if we had to tell one another how we're feeling. And in that moment, standing on level ground, eye to eye, he asks us to simply direct our gaze to those around us. And he says, look, you're not alone. Others around you are feeling the exact same things, good and bad, blessings and woes. As you can really see that and respond to that, you allow healing that you seek to now come to you as well. As you do to others, it can and will be done to you. Jesus spoke plainly 
there on the plain. He held up the antitheses of life, the good and the bad that's around us and within us. And then what he does is offer words of comfort and challenge together. He calls us to live a life of risk-taking, counterintuitive love, to live so that our neighbors and our banker and our employees know whether or not we're saved, to live and to care enough about ourselves that what we wish guides how we then treat others first. We are to always, always look behind the masks of others. And when we do that, then we step into a space where grace abounds, where forgiveness takes root, where joy far deeper than any passing happiness nestles within us, and love, love in Christ, through Christ, with Christ. Love wins. Thanks be to God. Amen.